I come to Comic-Con every year as just a fan lining up with Hall H and all that, and this is the first time, I'm from Canada. Yay! And Woohoo! Right? I was like, okay, so What's I'm gonna that? be on a panel with the most amazing astronaut from my country and the most amazing space captain in all the verse from my country. <laughs> I was like, this, this yeah! is gonna be pretty amazing. Go Canada. If you have any space questions, you can also, you know, I'll, I'll take a crack at a couple. You can't take the sky from him. <laughs> Reavers, right, Chris? <sighs> <laughs> oh, it's not gonna get better than that. Good night, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna open up the floor to some questions because you guys, there's, there's somebody here. You, I know you want to know something about somebody at this, uh, on the pineup. Anybody? Anybody? Bueller, right here in the front row. Hey, this is a question for our space people, not you, Nathan. Sorry. Understood. Real space Real people. Real space people. That's fair. I'm wondering in your mind, what is our generation's moonshot, and how, what's it going to take to get there? Uh, I'm not sure that every generation should have it a moonshot. Uh, I think doing something for the first time only happens once. And then after that, everybody wants to have a first landing on the moon every couple of years, which doesn't work. <laughs> and, and if we decided that our moon shot should be a Mars shot and we should have a first landing on Mars, I mean, uh, things didn't go well after the first moon landing. I mean, it, the whole thing crumped and the last two launches got canceled and there was a huge lull before the, you know, you, you can't fly in space just for the entertainment value. It has to be part of a long-term program. And we left Earth 15 years ago. We've got three people living up there right now. And the stuff we're learning on station is going to take us to a permanent base on the moon and eventually Mars. So I don't think moon shot is what you should be looking for. I think it's take the initial chances and then build on it to slowly explore and, and eventually launch with a companion somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Which seemed like a pretty good deal to me, actually. That's an excellent question. Nathan, you and I were talking backstage. If we were astronauts, we would start every conversation with. Yeah, well, when I was in space. <laughs> the thing about working in space is. If you, if you were to run for political office, every debate is over before it starts. You're like, Look, have you been to space? I didn't think so. You know what you need? Perspective. Perspective. <laughs> See, from space. Yeah. You look so small from up there. <laughs> I can see all your houses from here. <laughs> Another question? Right over here, the young man. Did you have a question? Were you waving your hand? No, no. You're just saying hi? I'll say hi. <laughs> oh, don't be shy. Talk it up. <laughs> nice work. Yeah. When did you come up with that song, um, You Can't Take the Sky Away From Me? You know that? That's a good question. <laughs> that song's a theme song to Firefly. I don't know if you know that. A little something I wrote. <laughs> right after I wrote The Pilot. Um, that was actually Joss Whedon wrote that. And, uh, and uh, I, I kind of listened to it. I went, I don't get it. It doesn't sound spacey at all. And then I saw the visuals and he put it all together. I was like, oh, I'm so dumb. That's so great. <laughs> Speaking of music and space, Chris. Yes. Certain music video. Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, there's a guitar up on the space station. Actually, I helped build a... Yeah, sounds bad. Right? And on my first space flight. Um, LAUGHTER uh, I, um, I helped build the... <laughs> um, I helped build the Russian space station Mir on my first space flight. And there was an old guitar up on the Russian space station made in St. Petersburg. And I realized when I got up to Mir, that's a great idea. You know, because you're up there for months or years at a time and, and uh, you need not just the science, but you need the culture and all the other stuff that goes along with it. And so um, our psychiatrists at NASA learned from it and they put a guitar up on the space station on one of the shuttle flights in August of 2001. And that guitar has been up there ever since. And it gets played pretty much every day. And I wrote a bunch of music up there and recorded it and um, have an album coming out next month. Get fact. out! Yes. Yes. Oh yeah, plug it! 
But uh, we space. say dropping. Uh, yeah, well, uh, it's just true. Um, but, but I also, my son Evan convinced me to do um, that version of Space Oddity, which just, it went crazy. How yeah, that, it did. You know, yeah. It's been seen. I totally watched it. Yeah. Sing it right now. Yeah. It's been seen like. We'll back you up. Come on. Go ahead. <laughs> Think of all the backup vocals in Space Oddity. Um, it, <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's, it's uh, been seen all over the place. But I think the interesting part of that is people who didn't even know there was a space station see it different as a result. And I was thinking about this earlier today. I was hugely inspired to actually fly in space by science fiction and, and Star Trek and, and 2001 A Space Odyssey. That's, that's what opened up my whole mind to the thought that this could even happen. And then followed all the practical stuff to actually fly in space. So if me playing that song up there lets someone see what it's actually like on a spaceship and opens up their mind to think about it differently, to me that, that's a big win. So I'm glad, glad it worked out. I'm glad we have that guitar up there in space. Can I ask him a question? Is please, okay? please. Uh, sir, when I visited, I uh, was hanging out with uh, uh, food people at uh, Johnson Space Center a few years ago. They, were, they asked me to try to figure out how to get uh, popcorn uh, to the space station. The popcorn was this real big problem because everybody wanted it. And I was like, well, you microwave it. And they're like, well, we can't because the explosive bolts to the mirror are set up by magnetrons, so we can't do that. And you can't Obviously. send it up already popped because it vibrates into little bitty bits of dust. Did you guys ever get your popcorn? Yeah, popcorn balls. We bring up, have you seen those that are glued jerp, together like jerp. a ball? So that's Trouble the is, when you bite into it, you know, all that little popcorn dust, then it goes everywhere and it's in your eyes and floats all over. So you get over one of the vents that has a nice tight filter on it, you lean over the vent and you eat your popcorn ball and then you vacuum it up when you're done. You have literally science every first row problem. <laughs> Better living. That's not, even a, that's not even a first world problem, is it? I don't know what, what? That other world. Well, well, when you're up there with nothing but some smelly guys and a guitar, that's a big deal. That's well, what I was gonna. Okay, I heard from a guy with a mohawk who happens to be sitting two seats down from me that the space station actually smells really bad. Yeah? No? <laughs> Confirm? Because uh, <laughs> like, there's the no space, vents. The space shuttle smelled really bad. Space shuttle smelled because it was little and had seven people, no bathing facilities, no sink. And, uh, and you could stay up there for two weeks. So it was like seven people in a camper van for two weeks with, with your toilets in there with you. So it was not great. But the space station, uh, I was there for half a year and you never once smelled another person at all. Never, none. It, has, it, it was, you know, if you go into a toilet after just after someone else used the toilet. Go on. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Sometimes it's like, don't go in there for a few, I, on the space station, you never had, you could go in right after somebody else, no smell, never, ever. It would work out really Why? well. Why? Even if they'd had a popcorn ball. Even, yeah, yeah, so to speak. But was the yeah. thing that attaches to you still warm? <laughs> <laughs> what, what I you were lucky, yes, yes. <laughs> what I love about this entire conversation is that it looks like the best candidates for living in space are total stoners. You've got guitars, snack food, and it smells awful. I was, just, I was I've totally eaten a bag of Cheetos over a vacuum cleaner to keep the dust down. <laughs> and I've totally said somebody opened an airlock, because... <laughs> Another question? Please, right here. Young lady, yes, you. Adam, I loved the lead balloon episode. That's still my favorite, but my question is actually for Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we're on a panel with an astronaut. We get it. He's, he's an astronaut. I watched so many of your videos, the ringing the towel out with water and seeing the water. Yeah, cool. It was awesome, but my question is, what was your recovery time, and what was the recovery like when you came back to Earth after being up there so long? So we have a choice of trying to make gravity on the spaceship or not, right? And you can't control gravity. All you could do is spin it or something, like, like in 2001 or you know some ideas. But to spin a spaceship is so mechanically complex. And you know how do you point your antennas? And how do you steer? And, and what if the spinning parts don't work? And all the metal you need. So we have decided it's not worth spinning your spaceship so far. We'll live without gravity. Trouble with that is, of course, without gravity, your body uh, doesn't get any exercise, but it has some real fundamental changes. So when I came back, my balance system didn't work. My heart couldn't lift the blood up to my head anymore, so you faint all the time. Uh, my uh, 
uh, immune system was depressed, my heart got smaller, and I lost a lot of bone. So when I came home, all of those things had happened. So I came home, oh, it's more like your stoner, probably. I, I felt all, <laughs> all weak and stumbled around and wanted to throw up all the time. It's just, just how I felt. Um, but the, that stuff passes within a few days. You feel sort of normal after a few days. And then after a couple of weeks, uh, you're, you're almost like you, you f but I couldn't run for about four months. I, my heart and my balance system, my muscles couldn't keep up. And it took about a year and a half to grow the muscle or the bone density back into my hips and my upper femur. But after about a year and a half, back to normal enough. Now, took a year and a half. Yeah. This is why I work with robots, because we can spin those spacecraft all the time. <laughs> Much easier. Do the robots have guitars to keep their humanity? <laughs> no, but uh, we did play a Will I Am song once from Mars. I don't know. Wasn't that the Is there an iPod on the, on the <laughs> rover? <laughs> There's a hard drive. I mean. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Another question? Please. My question is for Alton. Uh, you're involved. Well, thank God, finally. <laughs> because I got to tell you right now, I'm never doing a panel with thank a freaking astronaut ever again. <laughs> it's just so interesting. Uh, go ahead. Ta and please take your time, would you? Uh, She's going to ask you what you think about If you were Chris yeah, Hadfield. <laughs> Can I introduce her to him? Look, can we send him back to space? Uh, go you, ahead. You've been involved with so many um, food and TV and all these successful shows. So my question is, why do you think that food and television is becoming increasingly popular? And how do you keep creative and innovative with that? Okay, so um, the first answer is easy, I, I think. The, the second one's harder. So your question was, why? You know, why essentially when, say, 20 years ago, there were just a few cooking shows, mostly starring Julia Child and, and funny French guys, uh, why all of a sudden it's become an entire industry? I believe... Uh, because I've thought about this a lot and trying to plot my own trajectory. That's an astronaut kind of term. Um, <laughs> that in this day and age, um, with um, society being very fractured, you know, the internet changed everything for the way we communicate with each other, the way that we socialize with each other. We actually have very little culturally in common with each other anymore, or we don't really identify it. However, you talk to anthropologists, and they'll tell you there are two things that all people groups on Earth want to do in a group situation. Doesn't matter how cosmopolitan or how remote they are. They want to laugh in a group, and they want to eat in a group. So I believe that as we become more fractured as a society, we need food to hold us all together as a peoples. Because we all got to eat. Even occasionally, New York supermodels must take in calories, or they will die. <laughs> Um, and it connects us to each other, connects us to our heritage, connects us to our families. We crave that. We crave that tangible connectivity. Um, as for your second uh, question about keeping creativity um, going, for, for me, it's just a matter of looking around. I mean, I steal vast amounts from popular culture in my own, in my own work. So it's just simply a matter of uh, tuning in your, I don't know, your receptors and just kind of watching everything that's going on. Other than that, I have absolutely no freaking idea. Thank you for that very astute series of questions. <laughs> you, sir, please. Hello. I just wanted to ask about, like, robot sports, robot fighting, like, robotics. Like battle bots, <laughs> maybe? Exactly. <laughs> just in general, just what you guys think. I feel like this is the best. Just I'm for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when well, we when my robots it? fight, I give them timeouts. It's very Northern California of you, though, isn't it? Um, I played place bets on mine. I, will, I mean, obviously, Bobak and I are on the, the new BattleBots. What? Please watch it. 9 yeah. p.m. ABC, Sunday nights. Okay. Um, but one of the things that I really appreciate that ABC is doing with the show is that they want robot combat to be seen as an actual sport. Um, and their point to that being that, you know, you watch sports today and there's so much controversy about like concussions in the NFL or athletes getting seriously injured and ending their careers and you can watch robot combat and you still get all the same thrill out of it and you don't have to worry about anyone actually getting hurt which is pretty awesome and it's something you Are can you watch. Are you saying that robots don't have feelings or they, they well, can't feel? <laughs> they don't, maybe they get emotionally hurt. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I think I'm hoping that robot combat is something that becomes bigger and bigger because of that, because it still gives us that thrill of competition without actually people getting injured for it. What, 
Can I add something to that? Because this just made me think, this is really fascinating, I think, because this is the way that modern warfare is going in a lot of ways too, right? You can keep a soldier out of combat, you have a drone, but the drone may just be killing us. Another drone may be killing us. So we are going, we are increasingly moving to keeping soldiers out of combat, which is a very, you know, debatable military direction. But the point is, you know, we're seeing that reflected in sports now and, you know, in national defense. And I don't know. I, I think there's something to be, this guy could probably I, 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 I want to make a point, though, that I think giving a gun to a robot is the stupidest idea <laughs> possible. There is nothing worse than giving a gun to a robot. Because the first thing he's gonna, he's gonna be like, mm, oh, 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 boom! <laughs> then he's gonna go for coffee. But what's really, I've always been really fascinated about is like, it's always been very obvious when you go to war in the past. Because if, if one of our planes is flying somewhere and another country's plane comes and blows it up and a pilot dies, it's like, okay, we're going to war. They're attacking us. But if, if like another country's drone blows up your drone, like, is that now going to war? <laughs> like, right, it's like, it's like my Roomba point... grabbed your Lego, yeah. Right, it's like, okay, so we're gonna send more robots and they're gonna kill our robots. Are you at war at that point? It's not entirely clear, I don't know. Well, and then it becomes uh, one of the phrases they use in the military, push to go boom, because it becomes a place where you are so far removed from that conflict that, you know, d is there any human emotional resonance to the action? So like, what's to stop you next? All right, you shot down his drone, but if it's just as easy to blow up something and accept this many casualties, then, you know, you, again, that, that distance, uh, removing that human, what, kinest, you know, kinetic experience, I guess, I think is also dangerous. Let's ask the astronaut. It's too heavy. <laughs> He's Canadian, guys. Canadians don't believe in war. Just because no one wants to fight us. <laughs> Sir, in the green shirt. Right behind you. Um, oh, hello, uh, Nathan. Hi. <laughs> um, oh, uh, uh, I know a couple of people who uh, worked with you. I mean, I worked with like uh, Felicia and one of my, uh, 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 one of my improv teachers uh, once uh, co-starred with you on uh, one, uh, one Life to Live, I think. Oh, get out, really? Yeah, yeah, oh, sorry. God, I forgot. <laughs> Sometimes I forget about it. Anywho, uh, I was hoping to ask this at uh, the comment panel, and uh, uh, you know we're all uh, we're all uh, you know doing the what we do for you know uh, you know genuine reasons now. Uh, 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 when you uh, uh, when, uh, when you uh, I guess come into contact with uh, someone you really uh, uh, admire, do you just lose it? Even though that's when, when you met me earlier. That, even though that's uh, uh, breaking professional protocol, you know. Do I do I fan out? Do I geek out? Do I yeah. nerd out? Yeah. I totally do. Yeah. Yep. Did you not see what I did when I sat down next to an astronaut? Uh, or Will Wheaton? Or Will Wheaton? Yeah. That's all I do at Comic Con is freak out about the people I'm around, and then somehow they still talk to me afterwards. I don't know why. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to be a high school teacher in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and, uh, and, and now I'm, I'm here hanging out with these guys. I'm, I'm nerding out constantly all the time. Side story, Chris, last time I spoke to you, you were, it was long distance. You were actually on the space station. I got a call from the ISS. I, I, we arranged this, and he didn't know who he was calling. He's like, who is this? I'm nerding out. It was great. Another question, please. Hi, sweetie. Hi, everybody. Oh my goodness, I'm so you're all wonderful. Right, so I have a, out. <laughs> um, so my question's for all of you, and since this is nerds of pop culture, I was wondering, what's your favorite part about being a nerd in pop culture? Uh, I particularly love coming here to Comic Con. I was just driving here in one of the golf carts and looking at people, and the costumes that really, really invigorate me are the ones I don't understand at all. <laughs> and it's like someone who's wearing all purple, but with an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper taped to their chest. <laughs> like they thought about it, and I have no idea what they're going for. And yet what they're thinking is, I'm going to let my freak flag fly totally. 
And so what I love about the nerd cultures, I, I look at myself and I think all of us up here do as kind of permission machines. It's like, yeah, you know, being nerdy is giving in to the thing that you can't not do. And I, I love coming here because it's like an entire city filled with people doing exactly that. Yeah, I've always been, I, like I said, I've came to Comic-Con many times as a fan. And for me, what was really powerful about it the first time that I came was, like, I'm not really, you know, I'm a white guy, I'm not religious, I'm not really a part of any kind of group. <laughs> and had never really experienced being part of a group until I came to Comic-Con and it was really like this moment of, even though I might not be into the same weird piece of square thing on your shirt as you are or whatever show you're into, like every line that you are in waiting with someone, you can just instantly start talking to them next to you because you're all part of the same kind of celebration and then you're all just so excited for everything and I'm excited for whatever you're into and you're just like, instantly able to talk with everyone. Even on the, you know, I was staying way, 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 way out of town, coming in on the train every day, and, you know, there's an avatar standing there, and she's talking to Superman, and they're all just, like, talking about, you know, Firefly. <laughs> and it's just like, and you're just like, yes, this is my people, this is amazing, <laughs> like, I would come here every year. And that's been kind of my favorite part of being a nerd, is finally coming, finding a place like this where everyone can just celebrate it and accept it, and that's kind of the common thing that binds all of us, which I've always loved. Claire? I mean, I feel the same way. I I'd always felt like I didn't have a lot of friends who shared the same interests that I did, and I moved out here, and I started going Comic-Con, and I started finding more and more friends that had the same interests that I do. And it's really nice to be around people that don't judge you, that instead celebrate the same things that you celebrate. It's, it's nice. Anyone else? I, I, I just like the optimism at all. I think like nerds are really optimistic people. Kind of all trying to feel like they're making you know, the world a little bit more their place, a little bit more welcoming for everybody. And I kind of love that that vibe, and I think everybody, I mean, like, just looking around this, this group of people, I feel the same way. I'm like, these are all people who are trying to do something to, to make everybody kind of part of their community and part of their world, and I, and I like that. I mean, you're part of that, uh, Chris is part of that, Claire, I mean, Allison and I are good friends, so it's kind of amazing. That's a great word, optimistic, That's, I love that. One of the other awesome secret things is that because you're a professional nerd, you get to write off on your taxes all the nerd stuff that you yes! do. <laughs> yes! Yes! <laughs> like, you, you go to the movies, oh, that's a business expense. Uh, you buy a toy, yep. Now, all <laughs> that eBay surfing, deductible, yeah, like, every bit oh, of it. That's research, I'm sorry. And what about now with not even just uh, conventions, but also the internet? We have access now as nerds. We have access to the shows, to other stuff we want. We have access to you lovely people, um, to each other with the conventions and the internet. We can access, uh, I like the, th the guy with the purple and the white thing. I'm so into that. <laughs> There's like six other guys that I found them on the internet. Well, and also as uh, things like Twitter, I particularly love Twitter. It's my favorite social media because it's a conversation with the fans and it's a conversation I can dip into and understand what they're thinking and engage with the fans. And it changes, like, my Twitter feed is full of fantastic book, movie, and toy recommendations every single day. It's like this wonderful curated gallery for me and f me for them. So it's like, that makes it wonderful. Well, and I find utter validation in the fact that I now have a career within the pop culture nerd world, you know? Because growing up, it, like you guys, like I didn't have a lot of friends who were into the same stuff. Like I went to Star Trek conventions with my parents. I went to space camp for four years. Um, yeah. Like, but, I, but I did too, Chris. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, yeah. I did too. I'm throwing that out there. But you know, like as a kid, thankfully my parents supported this kind of passion in me because they're super nerds as well. I didn't request to go to the Star Trek conventions. They just took me with them because they're huge Treks, Trek fans. Um, but you know, you grow up in this and you kind of don't find your place. And now all of a sudden, the entire reason I have a career is because I loved this stuff so much as a kid. And it's enabled me to find all these people and to f connect with you guys and to find my friends and to find my, you know, my nerd family. And I think there's something really special in that. And I think it's awesome that today, in this day and age, that. Comic-Con's the biggest event you can possibly go to. Like, nerd culture is here to stay, and it is huge, and everyone is into it, and it's not just, you know, when we were growing up, that you're not the weird one out anymore. You can find your people. Well, and I think for me, 
Like, I was trying to, before this panel, trying to think of what nerd really means now, because I was like, I don't know what this panel's about. You know, what are we talking, what does geek mean? What does nerd mean? Because it used to be like in school, you had a pretty, I think, narrow understanding of like, that's a nerd, but now everybody claims it. But I think that, like, growing up, for me, what defined me as a geek or a nerd was that I like to dive deep into things. I like to know more about that. And like the cool kids, that was not, you know, superficial knowledge was fine because you got to move on and act like you don't care. But actually really caring about something and diving deep, and I think that that defines nerddom to me more than anything because the person who wears that costume, they don't just like that character on TV, they dive deep. You know, they went all the way. And I may not dive deep into that, but I dive deep into my stuff. So I think that's nerddom. I love it. Yeah, I think it's... I think it's being passionate about something because when you're super passionate about something, it's generally something that not the next person is really passionate about. And so that's sort of what being a geek is. And it, it's not just video games or Star Trek or whatever. It can also be sports. Like people super passionate about sports, you were totally a nerd. <laughs> when you memorize the stats. Yeah. Yes. I'm just wondering if there's ever a conversation with Allison and her parents. Like, no, you're going. You're going. And this is what you're wearing. Ferengi, oh. mom. No, I'm not joking. My parents would have, um, like, at every season finale of the show, they would have a party with all of their other Star Trek fan friends, and they would dress me up as a little red shirt and ensign, and I would pass hors d'oeuvres <laughs> when, I, when I was, like, eight or nine. And at the end of the episode, you'd die. That's yeah. exactly. No, I had to go to bed. Oh, right. Same as dying. Couldn't stay up for the party. We, had, we actually made a cake shaped like the insignia for the, for the series finale. How'd it taste? I'm sure it was delicious, but <laughs> I was very young. <laughs> See, I want to dive deep. Another one, right here, please, the blue. Wonderful Haku shirt. Hi, um, this question is for everyone. Um, well, first of all, thank you for donating your time. Um, I know all of us here are happy to give our money to Operation Smile. Um, if you could trade careers with anyone else on the panel, except for astronaut, <laughs> whose career would you want? Wait, with anyone on the panel? <laughs> I would trade with him. Because he can make anything. I make pie, you know? <laughs> And I make, I can cook a really good steak. He can like make a steak out of things that I can't pronounce. So I'll take his life. I would trade with Alton because he makes pie and I'm in. <laughs> My pie is freaking awesome. Yeah. Um, I would definitely trade with Nathan. I think seeing how much fun it seems like he has with all of his friends that are all these other people I adore and they all just hanging out making cool stuff. I was like, I mean, that's what I do with my friends, but he, all his friends are <laughs> amazing people. So I just switcheroo and then they'd all be my friends and then that would be great. I really like NASA. I'd trade with Bobak. I think that Bobak has a really cool job and he just gets to go and hang out with scientists and smart people all the time and do something that's beneficial for our entire planet. So that's what I would do. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I would trade with Nathan because he wears cool costumes. And I, I would love to know how to direct, how to take an idea that isn't anything concrete. There, there's no uh, structure to it. You're taking someone's idea and you're going to turn it into some sort of product that other people understand in a whole new way. That's, that's, that's a whole different type of thinking to me and I would love to learn how that works inside your head. So the astronaut just said he wants to trade with me? <laughs> Did that just it. happen? <laughs> Make that movie. Yeah, do we, okay, we got to shake on this, right? <laughs> Remember, like that Freaky includes Friday stumbling around right and wanting to vomit for a year. Yeah. I, I can't because nobody else wants to be a writer. So I'm stuck. But I think I'd go with food. I think the, the art on that side is, uh, yeah. Well, the thing about, about being a, a food geek is that you get laid more than any other kind of geek. <laughs> Definitely the, trading places. The, the, the way to a woman's heart. Uh, I, are you sure? The way to a woman's heart a still is the stomach. The way to the woman's heart is the stomach. And so if you can conquer that one, you know, I'm just saying. So I guess I'd trade with you then. Yeah. Well. <laughs> did, I, I just want to ask real quick. Did you say, are you sure? <laughs> yeah, I was looking at Nathan though. <laughs> Before we move on, Zach, you, directing. I'm, I'm totally into zombies. You're directing a movie. Right. 
Dead Rising. That's right. I just finished directing the Dead Rising film, uh, which was based on a really popular video game, uh, which was incredibly fun to be able to play the video game like crazy, writing down every time you do something in the video game, and you're like, oh, we could do that in the movie. <laughs> and then like writing it down and then going out and shooting it, it was super fun. And the amazing thing with a zombie movie is everybody you know wants to be a zombie. Like my Facebook feed was just every person I know being like, can I please be a zombie? So it just all your friends, you just get to walk them out and kill all of them. It was great. That took a weird turn. I changed my answer. I changed my answer. I want to be that guy. <laughs> Do we have another question? Right in the front row, right in the front row, right here. Uh, my but you have to stand up. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, my question's for Commander Hadfield. Um, I just want to say thank you for being an absolutely incredible and inspiration uh, ambassador for Ireland. Thank you. Um, Where in Ireland are you from? I'm from Fermanagh. Like up north, to the left, to the, bit to the right of Donegal, which I think ah, you've been to. I have. Yeah. Um, of all your experiences and everything that you've seen and done, both on land and in space, what is the one that you sort of struggle to put into words? Actually, it's interesting now, actually, to um, go out at night when the space station's going to go over and look up and watch it go past. Because I know exactly what it's like to be on Earth and what normal life is like. And I know exactly what it's like to live on a spaceship, you know, and, and the, uh, the, the, f the perpetual feeling of it and the magic of it and the weightlessness and, and the world rolling by underneath. But when I look up and see the space station go over, and if you haven't, you really should, um, I can't connect the two in my head. Yeah, I cannot yet reconcile the two of them together. And it's not like I don't understand them both. It's just there. There's such different human experiences that maybe later, maybe I'll be. And, and it's part of the reason I've been, you know, talking about it and writing about it and things is to try and get it fully sorted out in my own head as to how that fits into the rest of all the things that I've done. But uh, for me, that's probably the the hardest part is trying now to to uh, to make that all fit together inside myself. When you were watching the movie Gravity, did you ever say, fake, or hey, that's not bad? <laughs> but there, were, there was a nice satirical article that somebody wrote that was pretty funny, that I went into a movie theater and was like stood up and booing and threw my shoe at the screen. And, um, but did you? I was at, no, but I, I was at the Toronto Film Festival and, <laughs> when Gravity premiered, and... Um, I got asked to be there, and I'm watching Gravity, and like I realize about 15 minutes into it, I'm making faces. You know, I'm going, oh, I got to stop making faces because people are looking at me. And then about halfway through the movie, I realized they're going to ask me about this like crazy as soon as it's over. So I started thinking about what I was going to say about Gravity. And then at the end of it, uh, the director came out and his son and a couple of the producers and Sandra Bullock came out on stage. And uh, they were asking questions with the audience, and then someone stuck their hand up in the audience and said, I hear Commander Hadfield's in the audience. What did he think of the movie? <laughs> so, like, I ran down and jumped up on the stage. And, and, I mean, Gravity, no movie has ever had better visuals than Gravity. If you want to see what it looks like to be out on a spacewalk, I mean, the, the sense of enormity and, and the Earth being separate from yourself and, and to be alone in the universe. The movie showed that better than any other movie. But the plot line and the technical stuff, you know, I'm the worst guy in the world to see it. Um, so I got up on stage and, I, and, um, and uh, the director came over and put his hands on my shoulder and said, be kind. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, I said, the visuals were the best of any space movie ever done. And I said, I'm glad none of that stuff happened when I was on the space station. And I said, you know, if I ever fly in space again, I want to fly with Sandra. <laughs> and then I got off the stage and went and sat down again. Well done. Well done. In a blue hat. Hi. Thank you for all being here. Allison, I just want to say five gold in a party. Yes! Now, uh... Titan's you guys, grave, what? You guys all made a career out of being geeky or what you're passionate about. Were you fearful or had apprehensions about doing it? Or what made you guys go for it? So I, I made a career out of just doing my normal job uh, and then having a weird haircut uh, when we landed a car on Mars. Um, but it, I, no, it was awesome. I mean, it, 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 here's the thing about making a career out of a thing you love means that you're surrounded by the same kind of people. Um, and that's really the best part of it. So like every day I get to go to work with people that I really admire and, and I 
aspire to be as good as them and you know we share a common passion and share like a common goal it's the best thing I, I, I can't imagine and the fact that I'm on a panel with people like this just makes it you know really icing on the cake but it's it's really the coolest thing in the world to to you know pursue the thing you love I think everybody on stage has reinvented themselves several times already too and so I think um, to be the idea to give yourself a long-term passion, like everybody in this room has something, you know, if everything went perfect, what they'd love to be doing 20 years from now, but then accepting that what you're doing right now isn't exactly that, but make all the little decisions that keep shepherding your life along in that direction, because then it just, you get more of the stuff that you love on a regular basis. And, and so I think it's really important. And yeah, it won't go right, and you'll run into dead ends, but, but keep pursuing it because it's amazing what, what can happen with all the little decisions that take you that way. Well, and your question implies that there's a before and an after, like you made a decision and then something happened. And there's no such thing as a before and an after. And it's really easy to fall into the trap when you when you look at you know the panelists up, the, up, up here and think of their lives as looking linear because the stories are told in a linear fashion, <clears throat> but they're the farthest thing from linear possible. And it's really, uh, to me, it's really important to remind people like there's always going to be left turns and right turns and wrong turns and dead ends, and that's completely intrinsic to the process. There's, there's a, it's, it's funny you talk about that. There's no like moment that that everything changes or there's there a reinvention. Yourself. I had a very clear moment. You did? Yeah. Well, I, but but here's the, it's like okay, I, no, no, no. I did too, I thought. It's like I was directing TV commercials and watching food shows and deciding, you know what, these food shows are boring me. I want to make food shows, so I'm going to quit doing what I'm doing and I'm going to go to culinary school. And everybody said, you are out of your freaking mind. You are going to be working at McDonald's in five years or you know, get ready for your red vest at, at Walmart. Um, and and then we all called it career change, but it wasn't. It wasn't a career change at all. And it only, it, you have to get further back from it and live it a while and realize, oh, that wasn't a career change at all. I was simply acquiring new skills for what I was meant to do anyway. I think that one of the problems is that people think that their passion is enough to get them where they want to go. Oh, I want it so bad. The universe could give a crap about how bad you want anything. What the universe cares about and responds to is how well you can align your capabilities and skill set to what it is you really want to do. Then you act get somewhere. That's what everybody up here has done. We knew that we wanted to do something, but we also were realistic about our, our skill sets and what we're capable of doing. Um, so I think that you've got to be willing to roll the dice on big changes in your life. You've got to keep the little, keep the little piddling crap away so that you're not living in a cage. But you have to realize that it's a big, wide continuum and that um, you know, in, in 20 years you're going to look back and you may not even see where that big turn was anymore. Yeah, one of the things that I've been surprised by as I've managed to get successes that I only dreamed of a few years ago is how difficult it is the whole time. You, I think you often think there's like a breaking in moment and then you get through that door and there's just like gummy drops and everyone's there and you just get to do whatever you want and that doesn't exist. <laughs> and it's like this um, huge struggle the entire time. And the thing that I've been trying to deal with the most is I think with driven people, you really want something. You want to achieve making a movie or getting to the space station or <laughs> whatever it is. You, you have this goal that is your driven thing. And it's really difficult to not say to yourself, okay, I'm not enjoying what I'm doing right now, but I'm gonna be happy when I get that. Because what happens is you get that and you're maybe happy for five minutes and then there's something else that you want. And you've spent 95% of your time like not being happy with where you are now and, and kind of putting your happiness at a, at a moment in the future. And so what I've been really working on is just trying to really enjoy the process of getting to that point because that's most of your life. <laughs> and as soon as you get there, there's going to be something else you want to achieve. I'm sure Steven Spielberg is still, exactly, he's just something he wants to achieve and he's struggling to try and, and get there. And so... No, he's pretty it, much good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's one guy, there's one guy. Leave but him out of it. It's, it's hard to really be appreciative of all the little steps and all the things that go wrong. And a friend of mine just told me this saying uh, last week. He's saying, these are the good old days. And trying to remind yourself of kind of like that moment of 
of trying to get something made is actually all the work. And so that is actually you doing what you want to be doing. And I'm trying to remind yourself all that time is very difficult, but it's important when you're a driven person to kind of celebrate all of the missteps and all of the like kind of struggles to get there. Somebody took a grease pencil on the inside of the space station and wrote on the wall, there's nothing more important than what you're doing right now. <laughs> and I think it's a really good thing to keep up in your head. No, I mean, it's just because it, it absolutely is not. Well, it's really hard when you're a driven person to not, because you just put everything on that thing you're trying to achieve. And it's, um, you really just have to be present, which is difficult, but really important. Well, and your question too kind of implies, I think this is speaking to Adam's point a little bit, that there is confidence at any point along the way. Like, I don't think I've ever felt like, oh yeah, I'm here it is, you know. I, I'm constantly, and, and I, I think I speak for pretty much everybody here, and certainly everybody in a creative field, that you're constantly clawing your way with a great deal of uncertainty, like the ground's eroding beneath you. Yeah, and you're like, oh, so when are they gonna all find out I'm just pretending I know what I'm doing? And you're like, okay, <laughs> I'll just keep saying. <laughs> so your only choice is to have fun. Yeah. yeah. All right, so next question. In the back, the lovely red hair. Why, thank you. Um, that was a very philosophical and, and wonderful discussion. Right, I'm yeah. learning things. I feel like I'm gonna be a better person at the end of this panel. I'm really excited about this. Well, I'm gonna be a, a little bit more superficial. Um, Adam, I was wondering, did five people find you on the floor yesterday, and what were you, and did it involve any cooling systems? Uh, well, the, uh, so yesterday morning, Alton and I hit the floor as the twins from the Matrix. Yeah. Dreadlocks suck. Dreadlocks. <clears throat> the best was that io9 actually published a picture of us today and they didn't realize it was us. <laughs> that. Sweet. I didn't know that. You committed. Really? Yeah. And then uh, yesterday afternoon, I hit the floor with a bunch of other Judge Dreads. Uh, and we went around and the first people to recognize me was a sweet couple and they looked up and they said, oh, Dredd, we'd like to... Because <gasps> I had Savage on my badge. This morning, um, I had spent the last five years building a Clavius suit, a silver spacesuit from 2001 A Space Odyssey. I built two of them, uh, one for me, one for a friend. Uh, and uh, the friend isn't getting it yet because today I wore it Wait, with Chris Hatfield friend? out on the floor. <laughs> Am I going to be the Are friend? The right? I want to be the friend. Um, it has a completely uh, integrated ice pack in the backpack that circulates through the shirt. Chris said it kept him very cool. We, we, we walked around, and uh, we did get spotted uh, a couple of times. Yeah, it was awesome. Even with the uh, visor you couldn't see through, yeah, people uh, figured out because it was such a good costume, only you could have made it. I, I, I realized I was one up on him because he'd never put on a fake spacesuit before. <laughs> Another question, we have time for a couple more. Right here, right here, gentlemen. So growing up in the, in the 80s and being a nerd in the 80s, part of the club was that you were something unique, something small, something, like, like you said, you were, there were many of you, so that was nice. So as, as nerd culture's expanded, and as, as nerd culture's grown, especially as it comes into contact with some of the, the negative sides of what nerd culture has had come to be and come to be known as, or that insular thing, what are you guys' thoughts on the, the expansion of nerd culture, especially as it comes into conflict with some of the cultural values that, that are pushing into it on the outside? Well, we just keep having to weed out the misogynists. <laughs> that seems like a pretty good starting policy as far as I'm concerned. Wow, that killed it. <laughs> Still killing it. Anyone? Anyone have anything to add? Nothing? It, it, the question was, how do we feel about it growing so much? The, the, the changes. What are your opinions the, on the changes? In the I mean, I think, I think it's awesome that so many people are embracing this. I was commenting just at this Comic-Con alone. I feel like there's way more families here than there normally are. People with their babies and things like that. And I love that uh, embracing anything nerdy has become a family trip. You know, that it's something you share with just your family. It's not something that you go and you find your you know, four other friends and you play Dungeons and Dragons. It's, it's something you can embrace with your entire family. And I guess as someone who was lucky enough to grow up in a family like that, it's, it's really cool to see it spreading. And, and I say the more the merrier, man. Yeah, I think the only thing for me that I, I think I totally agree with Allison. I think it's also awesome because so many people in the community are creators and creative people. And to see that expand, it's really great. 
Um, the only thing that, that scares me a little is there's sometimes this culture of like, no, this is my thing and you can't have it. Uh, and I don't want to see that happen. And I think if we, if we actually stay true to our real values of this is a community and we welcome people in the community, we're good. This is, this is, the, right way to, this is the right way to appreciate uh, culture. Nerd is no longer niche. I like that. <laughs> Should be on a shirt. But I want to be in a yours. nerd niche. Another question? Young lady right here, about the red hair. Hi. We'll give you a microphone right there. Since several of you have backgrounds in the hard sciences, what is your favorite science fiction? What kind of drew, drew you into the, the pop culture side of it? Is there a certain movie or TV series or something that you, know, that you look back on fondly? Sure. I mean, Star Trek for me, the optimism of the show and the fact that it represented a, a better humanity made me want to work towards creating that itself. Um, and then Arthur C. Clarke, just because he did such an incredible job of marrying real science and science fiction. What really inspired me was Jules Verne, Mysterious Island, actually, which was uh, pitting people that had had a scientific background but putting them in an entirely new environment and then having to invent and create and use what was there in order to build a, an ability to live successfully. To me, that was uh, uh, just the, the essence of human adventure and uh, it inspired me as a young, young kid. Michael Crichton for me. Yes. I, mine was Isaac Asimov, for sure. Um, I mean, I, I loved Star Wars um, and I was also really into... Kurt Vonnegut books. Um, so, I, I mean, I didn't pick a career in science, but it definitely, it, those things helped me fall more into the geek world. Yeah, for me it was Star Trek TNG. That was pretty much my, and just had that on at all the time. Um, the other kind of fundamental movie for me was Jurassic Park, because I was taken to it when I was 10 years old, having only ever seen children's movies, sitting, like, <laughs> terrified. Like, li my mom had no idea what it was, and I was really that moment where you think everything is real, and I was screaming and covering my eyes and had nightmares, but I remember into the second act, once they're past the fence, and they're g I remember realizing, oh my god, I'm alive. Like, <laughs> like... I'm, this movie hasn't killed me. And then that moment of like, oh, I hope I didn't miss the dinosaurs and being really, really like excited. And then the, the kitchen scene and everything at the end was the, actually watch that. And then, then that, from that moment on, wanted to make movies and kind of remade that scene over and over and over again in most of my films. But that was really cool at that moment, actually in the middle of the film, realizing what movies were, that they weren't real and that it had that effect. So that was kind of my pivotal movie. I saw Jurassic Park in the theater four times. <laughs> four times, and that was, you know what, 1994 when people didn't really do that all that much? Four times! You were and my dad nerd. bought it for me the day it came out on VHS. <laughs> VHS. <laughs> and I was homesick from school with the flu and I watched it every single day. No, I had already been homesick and he brought it home as a present for me. And then I watched it every single day for a week. That's how much I love that movie. I used to take the chocolate, you know, the turtles' chocolates? You know those ones? I'd flip the canister over, you know, the little, little plastic tin, and I'd push those things like buttons and pretend I was on Star Trek. Anything I had to do <laughs> took like 12 buttons. And then I had to turn it over and reset them all. <laughs> you to open that, open it again, you got it. And I also liked that they didn't have any schedules. Like there was no like, it's 8 a.m., you gotta get up, and this is what you have to do. It's like, let's go this way now. All right, another one right at the back. Oh, you know what, I'm sorry. I take that back. I have to be that guy. I was having such a good time, you guys. I know. This was a wild panel. This got really deep and really wonderful for a while, didn't it? Thank you guys so much for being here. This has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you.